Thanks for coming, everybody. This has uh, been a really great series, and uh, turnout has been good every time, so that's awesome to see. Um, I'm the wildlife biologist for the BLM, and um, today I'm going to talk about human impacts to wildlife, like what activities humans uh, do that have an impact on wildlife. And that's a pretty incredibly huge topic. So um, I'm going to kind of go over some background concepts, look at a big picture of how humans change the surface of the earth, and then I'm going to focus really on the Gunnison Basin, and I'm going to focus mainly on sagebrush ecosystems in this area since that's our, our greatest land cover around Gunnison. So, um, as these pictures show, and as you probably already know, humans have had an incredible impact on, on the surface of the Earth. We have changed, uh, some people estimate, over 50% of the Earth's surface has actually been changed by humans. Um, and within the last 40 years, uh, the population of humans has doubled and it's expected to double again in the, last, in the next 40 years. And that's a um, pretty eye-opening number. I'm, I'm 49 years old, and I grew up on the Front Range. And um, I remember a very, very different Front Range than we have now. Um, this, this picture represents sort of what the Earth would look like with no humans on it. Uh, that's New York City that came out of National Geographic magazine. Um, as you can imagine, if you were any sort of wildlife that had evolved over the last thousands of years, millennial, uh, you uh, would be having to adapt quite quickly to a very changing uh, landscape uh, over the last 200 years. Um, so I, I sort of talked about uh, growing up on the Front Range, and I remember moving away after I was done in college and coming back uh, from time to time to visit my mom and just being astounded by the, the degree of change on the Front Range. And so I have this little video that kind of shows, I've zoomed into the South Platte, Rev Res or South Platte River, and That is, looks like a pretty natural system, but as you zoom out, you can see pretty quickly that there's almost no land that hasn't been uh, through some sort of conversion. You know, agriculture, you have oil and gas, that's going up the South Platte River. Um, you, you've had towns for a long time, and in between, you, you still have towns, but you have almost complete conversion. Um, and and now we have these bigger urban areas, uh, pretty densely packed, and in between these towns and urban areas are also a lot of uh, suburban sprawl. And uh, so our land has changed pretty drastically. Um, so uh, what, how does that uh, impact uh, wildlife? Um, there are some pretty obvious um, Impacts. I mean, everybody here could probably think of it, write down a pretty long list of impacts to wildlife. Um, but um, we, I only have 20 minutes to talk, so I'm just going to kind of give you a list of how we change, uh, how humans changing the surface of the earth affects wildlife. Um, we've introduced many chemicals, poisons, toxins, through herbicides, fertilizers, air pollution, oil spills, toxic compounds, um, even prescription uh, drugs are getting into our water supplies and impacting wildlife. Um, hunting, I put down there, and that's more of a historical change. Humans have had a, a very big impact through hunting on a few different species. Um, that uh, one example is the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon was such an abundant animal that nobody ever thought that it could ever go extinct, um, but it was hunted into an extinction. But uh, if you were here the first night, you can remember Brandon talking about the North American model of wildlife management, and I think we do a much better job today. Um, but we also have 
been removing ecosystem engineers like the beavers from the landscape. We've uh, removed predators and we're overfishing. And as you take these species out of the environment, you also changing habitat, you're changing the balance of the communities. Um, other impacts include disease. And the very biggest one that I'm mainly only going to focus on tonight is habitat. Uh, last week, if you came here, uh, you watched Pat talking about the four brothers and talking about habitat for wildlife. And what are the four brothers? That's basically everything the animal needs to survive. It's food, it's water, it's cover, and it's the space. It's its home range. And um, when we have these massive conversions of landscapes, we lose that habitat and you lose the ability to either survive or survive well because some piece of your habitat is missing and you need all the pieces to survive. Um, but up here in the Gunnison Basin, uh, you might think to yourself, well, that's the front range and that's the, um, and that's the world and we don't have that problem up here. And, and you'd be um, right, we do have a very uh, we are really lucky up here that we have a landscape that has not changed nearly as much as a lot of places. Um, this is a picture of looking at back towards uh, Crested Butte and uh, down the East River. And so you can see that over a over hundred years that landscape has changed very li little. Um, some of the historic changes that um, we have had in the Gunnison Basin include agriculture and grazing, uh, changes to the forests, mining and development in dams. Um, agriculture and grazing is one of the, um, uh, the uh, most, uh, it's what sustained the Gunnison Basin um, for, you know, hundreds of years. That's what people came up here, became ranchers and uh, farmers and came up here and uh, lived on an agriculture by grazing cattle and uh, raising uh, hay. And that's a picture from the Cimarron, from Cimarron, that's an old picture of uh, cattle, cattle ranching. Uh, another way that humans have had a historic uh, impact on the landscape is um, our forests. Uh, we've, um, back when we were, uh, had a lot of miners in the area, they did a lot of logging and it was mainly for building cabins and heating things and you look at the, some of these logging camps and, and there were like no trees around. And so we've, we've re we removed a lot of the uh, forests in certain areas and then it all came back as an even age stand. Um, and then we've had fire suppression for about the uh, last 80 years or so. And with even age stands of forests, you end up having, um, you don't have the diversity in the forest. Normally there's uh, small scale disturbances within the forest, there's small fires, um, it grows back with younger trees. Um, so you have these even age stands that aren't um, healthy anymore. Um, and then lately with uh, drought and um, uh, longer growing seasons and just really uh, we've had a, everybody knows about the um, insect inf infestations in our spruce fir forests, our dug fir, and now it's apparently moving into like ponderosa pine and some of the pine trees too. But uh, this picture might blow anybody away that didn't live in Colorado, but I think everybody here is kind of used to seeing that. Um, and I'm actually not going to talk a lot about forests in this talk just because there's, um, it's, it's too big of a subject. That, that could be a subject on its own, how changing forests affect the wildlife. Uh, so another historic um, change to the landscape in this area was mining, of course. Uh, the two pictures on the left are from Monarch. And uh, you can't really see it as well as you could in the book, but uh, you can. there's 
all the trees on the side of the land, hillside are, are, have been cut down. Uh, there's uh, a little town there, and now it's forested, and there's still mining. There, everybody's been over Monarch Pass and have seen that big mine there. Um, but that, that has changed our landscape. Um, and then uh, on the right is another mining town. And uh, with all this mining, we ended up with a lot of adits and um, um, changing the water quality, which, you know, I if you have a vast landscape and you're digging everywhere, you have uh, water quality, uh, problems with water quality and water drainage, and uh, that's one lingering effect of, of that uh, era. And uh, development in dams, and I'm going to talk about developments and uh, development in a little bit, so I won't go over that much, but this is a cool picture from Sapanero, which was the little town that was inundated, and uh, the, where is the bridge? Oh, there's a little red dot on the bottom uh, on the along the Lake Fork on the right side. That's currently today. That's from Google Earth. And that little red dot is that same little bridge where that's, that's crossing right there. But as you can imagine, uh, with that much, that much cold water, um, cold deep water, and no longer uh, fast moving streams, uh, you have a pretty big change in fish communities, um, and the streamside riparian has changed drastically too. The uh, with a with a river, you have movement across the landscape well, with uh, seasonal flooding, and you have uh, heterogeneous um, patches of riparian. And now we have the big lake, and um, most of the. Uh, most of the edge of the lake is uh, devoid of vegetation that can support a uh, great diversity of wildlife. So um, how we look at how humans impact wildlife can be looked at at a habitat scale versus a landscape scale. That's uh, it's a, it's, um, important because at a habitat scale, you're making small changes at a site. You might be converting habitat to a different land cover, say if you're doing a farm or some sort of uh, clearing for uh, development. Um, and that's only going to impact individuals. That may impact a few individuals, but it's a, it's a much smaller scale, a habitat scale. Um, at the landscape scale, you, you end up um, affecting wildlife populations, and you can affect them quite drastically. You can um, affect wildlife populations that move through the area seasonally um, if you've taken away a vast area of uh, habitat. Um, you can affect whole wildlife communities, and if bad enough, you can uh, affect the biodiversity. Um, this picture zoomed in on the right is uh, down in north of Farmington. And so you can say, oh, well, there's just a few pads and some roads. Uh, you zoom out a little bit, and it's pretty incredible. Uh, the whole landscape is dotted with it. And this, this picture is pretty small, but up here is Durango, and down here is Farmington. And if you look at that on Google Earth, the entire area um, all in here is completely um, roaded with oil and gas development. And so you have to imagine that that has some sort of impact, uh, uh, disrupts linkages and um, as well as uh, small scale habitat for individuals in the area. So I'm going to talk about the major habitat types of the Gunnison area. And these are um, the habitat types, yeah, like I said, the Gunnison area. Um, so it's mainly sagebrush and the habitat types within our sagebrush. Um, so sagebrush, I know that there's a lot of opinions out there. I'm not sure they're all in this room, but 
A lot of people will talk about how sagebrush is vast, it's all over the place, it doesn't have, it looks sort of uh, devoid of uh, animals, and it doesn't seem to have much value. How much, how much impact can removing sagebrush or degrading sagebrush have on wildlife? Um, but sagebrush is actually, it, um, it provides cover for a high diversity of uh, perennial grasses and forbs and um, it also holds snow, so it, pr it retains moisture on the landscape. And um, when you have a, a good healthy system of young and old sagebrush stands, um, you also, you end up with uh, sort of a heterogeneous la uh, landscape with um, different types of habitat. There, there are wet meadows throughout, um, there are drainages with small riparian areas, um, but all of the, um, all of the land cover, the um, perennial grasses and forbs are incredibly important to wildlife. Um, Pat talked about sage grouse last week and the life cycle of the sage grouse and uh, the having that high diversity of grasses and forbs um, is what's key for helping them uh, raise their young out in the brood rearing habitat because it provides insects for the young. Um, it also provides uh, protein rich forage for mule deer um, after the winter when they've um, been eating sagebrush. So it's, and yeah. Um, other uh, habitats within our sagebrush landscape. Uh, other habitats within our uh, sagebrush landscape include riparian. This is a very small portion of our landscape. We do have uh, big, bigger cottonwood um, patches, um, but they're very limited and they tend to be in larger drainages um, and pretty sparse, um, even like a small patch at the bottom of a drainage and then you'll make your way up about half a mile and you might see another patch. It's not contiguous riparian habitat like we have along the Gunnison River. Um, also within the, um, the sagebrush, we have uh, riparian shrubs. Um, um, those tend to be around seeps and springs and in the bottoms of uh, more wet drainages, you have uh, stringers of willow that provide a uh, high diversity of habitat for wildlife. Um, one of the other major riparian area uh, types that we have within the Gunnison Basin are these uh, wet meadows. And um, this, this one on the left is actually part of a restoration um, area, but these, these wet meadows hold moisture on the landscape when they're functioning well, and they um, keep the area moist, they provide habitat for a lot of animals, and they were pretty extensive across the landscape um, before, they were, uh, before they were degraded. So they do provide valuable ha habitat for wildlife and livestock. So uh, one concept that is uh, kind of important for talking about all this is uh, conservation of species. So we talked about uh, individuals in a habitat. We talked about uh, affecting populations and affecting communities and affecting <coughs> biodiversity. Um, and as land managers and as people, um, it's, it's not always easy to, look, to try and conserve every single species. But there are certain species like our uh, Gunnison sage grouse that have habitat needs that represent other, other species. And so in uh, conserving these keystone species or umbrella species, we're also helping to conserve many other riparian or sagebrush obligates on the landscape, which include uh, burr sparrows, um, pronghorn, 
Um, there's something like, I think I had notes here. Uh, in, in Colorado, the Natural Heritage Pro Program has ranked um, quite a few species of cons greatest conservation need, um, including the brewer's sparrow. Um, in sagebrush ecosystems, we have 91 bird species, 88 mammal species, and 45 reptile species. So um, it's certainly um, a habitat worth uh, conserving. Um, one of the made greatest threats to uh, our sagebrush ecosystems around here is cheatgrass. And I don't know how many of you know about cheatgrass. Probably a lot of you know about cheatgrass. But cheatgrass, um, for a long time it was believed that cheatgrass could not um, become an invas a major invasive species across the Gunnison Basin because we were too cold and they w it would never take off and completely take over like it has over in the Great Basin. Um, one of the problems with cheatgrass is that once, once it, it can flower twice a year and um, it produces dry seed heads um, and then, especially in the Great Basin, um, it catches fire and then it wipes out these sagebrush, um, sagebrush areas. And the sagebrush isn't used to, sagebrush has like a 200 year return interval, fire return interval. So um, it ends up burning the sagebrush and then the, the cheatgrass has a lot of seeds and you can see that in that picture. And um, the seed bank is quite plentiful and it grows back uh, right away. Um, and then growing twice a year, it, it really produces quite a bit of seed and takes over vast areas. Um, it's not, nu it's an annual, it's not nearly as nutritious as the perennial grasses in Forbes. And, um, and so it's, it's a big problem. We have people over the last 10 years, more and more people have become more and more concerned about it. Um, you can see on this map, I took the BLM's uh, map of sage grass, or excuse me, cheatgrass and you can see how a lot of that's concentrated near road areas, so humans are uh, very likely spreading it, or they are spreading it, um, and it is becoming much more extensive and more of a problem, and that's one of our biggest concerns at the BLM, it particularly for wildlife. Um, so human modified landscapes in the Gunnison Basin. I'm gonna talk about development, I'm gonna talk about grazing, and um, I'm going to talk about recreation. Um, and this is development. And um, so somebody builds a little house, and it's that habitat scale thing where they're not having that big of an impact. They might take out some, a little riparian stand. They might convert um, some area. <laughs> they might build a little pond, which will draw wildlife, um, can draw um, ducks and deer and wildlife for watering. But at the same time, it can also draw um, species that wouldn't be comfortable there without it. So you end up with uh, non-native species coming in. You have uh, pets, which can be um, detrimental to the wildlife there. And then you have people planting things that are not native and can end up um, spreading. So I have a picture of oxide daisy, and that's, that's a pretty bad one in our uh, forests it, along trails, and people will plant that in their yards. Um, and so going back to the habitat scale to the landscape scale, when you end up uh, with multiple houses in a whole entire area, um, and you end up with an area dotted with roads and houses and removing habitat across the landscape, you end up with more of a landscape <laughs> scale problem. <coughs> um, so now I'm going to talk about grazing. And um, this is a pretty simplistic little um, diagram of uh, livestock grazing and how, how much grazing impacts and how it impacts the grasses. And so with a non-degraded, well-managed livestock grazing system where you're not putting them on early, you're uh, moving them out quickly, 
and moving them across the landscape and you have not too many cows, you end up with a mixed community of perennial grasses and annual grasses. Um, the more um, a landscape is grazed down to extremely overgrazed, you get less and less, fewer and fewer perennial grasses, more annual grasses, and uh, the landscape actually becomes more unpalatable for livestock as well as wildlife. And you eventually, in an extremely overgrazed system, you end up with bare soil and only annual grasses. Um, and in grazing, I'm just going to talk about this pretty briefly. It's a whole subject on its own. But um, domestic sheep grazing is something that has, can have a big impact on uh, bighorn sheep. Um, Domestic sheep carry uh, lots of pathogens that are they're immune to and that bighorn sheep are susceptible to. And uh, it's believed that vast die-offs of bighorn sheep have been uh, responsible, uh, domestic sheep grazing has been responsible for vast die-offs of bighorn sheep, like literally thousands of bighorn sheep. Um, once one bighorn is sick and can come back to its herd um, and uh, spread the disease, um, Animals that survive um, can um, continue to survive, but in, in these populations that have been infected with uh, these diseases, they, um, they the lamb recruitment can be reduced for up to 20 years, and you can end up with this like depressed herd for 20 years. And uh, so livestock grazing, domestic sheep grazing in bighorn habitat is, is a a very big uh, concern. Um, I'm going to go back to that. The, the map right there shows uh, 4A probabilities of bighorn rams, and this was taken from actual data running through some models that um, output a 4A probability. And so you can see where it's darkest, um, and, and the dark blue are, are bighorn herds in this area. Um, Gunnison. Gunnison is right there, and this is the Alpine Loop area, and you can see there's, there's quite a few bighorn herds in this area, and it's very hard to see, but um, there are a lot of the green outline are um, domestic sheep um, grazing allotments. So. Um, other human activities in the air, other ways grazing affects um, the landscape um, are these wet meadows, and that's that's um, as cows are drawn to an area, they're drawn to these. The more because it's an arid ecosystem, and we get very little rain a year. I think we get something on up on South Parlin. We get something on the order of like 10 inches a year. Um, it's a pretty dry system. There's not a lot of uh, w open water for cows, and so they're drawn to all these springs and seeps where they can trample them. Um, they're also uh, drawn to any wetter areas because of shade, um, and so they overuse these areas. Um, and these areas are also very disproportionately important to, to other wildlife as well. Um, and then once the cows come trailing through the area over many, many years, as the picture shows on the right, uh, you end up with down cutting and stream bank erosions. And as the water continues to down cut, it dewaters the actual floodplain. And um, you end up with a hud head cut that can is at the very leading edge of that um, erosion channel and it can keep moving back and continue to downgrade um, and dewater the uh, wet meadows. And eventually you end up with no wet meadows in that area. Um, so, and that's sort of on a landscape scale, thinking about that, that's a picture of a head cut right there. And you can see those out there if you tune your eye to those. Um, on the left is a wet meadow that's uh, starting uh, that has some erosion and is starting to uh, degrade away. Um, oh. And then on the right, we have a picture. If you think about how many, 
if you think about how many of these wet meadows are out there, think about this Google Earth um, picture and think about wet meadows in all of these little drainages and um, if they've been degraded and um, have reduced the water table um, and there's no open water, you end up changing a vast area. And so over the years with uh, intensive cattle grazing, um, these areas have become drier and drier. And that's, uh, Russ talked about the restoration of the wet meadows last week. Um, and, and you'll see um, newspaper articles and all sorts of things about uh, rest restoring these wet meadows. And that's some pretty good work that can return uh, water to our landscape. Uh, so also we have uh, recreation. Recreation, as we know, um, recreation is uh, a huge deal around here. Most everybody is uh, outdoorsy, and we all like to get out there, and um, that's part of the reason why we live here. And in Colorado, our population, I wanted to read some statistics here. Currently, our population in Colorado is estimated to be uh, uh, 5.6 million people. By 2040, that ex number is expected to increase, increase to 8.5 million people. Um, and how is that, how does the Colorado's whole population affect us? Well, in the Gunnison Basin, we've grown from by 7% since 2010. Summer visitation increases every year. Um, national, we've become more popular nationally and regionally as a destination for recreation. Um, and these numbers are, con are expected to continue to increase, um, particularly after they build um, the uh, paved road over Taylor Pass or over um, uh, Cottonwood Pass. Yep. <coughs> So how does, how does recreation uh, fit into how that affects wildlife? Um, there's three major things that recreation does that um, uh, affects wildlife. Recreation brings in weeds. You can see this uh, picture of a trail, and on either side is uh, cheatgrass. And if you look at a lot of our cheatgrass maps on either side of the roads, um, cheatgrass is coming in. If you ride your bike at Hartman's and you look along the side of the trail, you can find cheatgrass. And it hasn't grown and um, completely taken over the area, but um, it's it, with more and more recreators, um, it, it will only hurt uh, the problem. Um, another problem is roads. Russ talked a lot about roads last week, so I'm not going to go over that, but uh, there's many reasons to be concerned about roads. You think, oh, roads only 14 feet wide, what, what good, you know, how much <coughs> can that do? But you lose uh, security habitat, you increase disturbance, you increase weeds, and there's a lot of research that shows that uh, high road densities greatly impacts big game. Um, it impacts uh, grizzly bears, we don't have grizzly bears here, but uh, there are a lot of uh, large mammals that are uh, very uh, directly uh, affected by uh, road densities, and that can affect their productivity and uh, have reduced productivity in an area with higher road densities. And so that was it. I don't have any idea how many minutes that was, but... All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about population biology and management. Uncomfortable truths, I think the newspaper actually said cruel truths, characteristics, and counting them without using your fingers. So I'm going to get to this quiz question in a bit, um, but the answers are closed now. I've got them tabulated up. I've actually got the answer here in a flash drive. 
but we're going to get to that in a second. Okay, so the other night, one second here. Okay, so the other night, Russ and Pat introduced to you guys these levels of biology. And as a wildlife biologist for a state wildlife agency, most of my time is centered on the population level. And a population is just a group of individuals or a grouping of a grouping of individuals that, of the same species that breed, live, and die in the same geographical area. Now, state agencies do have biologists that specialize outside of population biology all the way down to the cellular level. Um, we've got pathologists that work for us and uh, those that work all the way up to the ecosystem level. But population biology is often considered a core discipline of wildlife management and conservation. So why not the individual level, you might ask? Well, it's primarily because these wild populations have too many individuals to take care of as intensively and humanely as we do our own offspring, our own pets, and even zoo exhibits. And we are all strong wildlife advocates and we do care about every animal out there working for a state agency. But the reality is, is that individual level management is inefficient. So this might include responding to every report our, our agency responded to every report by someone with an, this thing I might call abandoned baby animal syndrome. And actually more animals can probably be conserved by targeting entire populations of animals or maybe even human populations through educational efforts. Now explaining why it isn't going to work out for that critter is probably going to work better than actually trying to help that critter, especially after someone, after someone picked it up. And agency wildlife officers and biologists do not have the time to help out every individual critter in need. Now, given the amounts and types of funds available to wildlife agencies, Brandon talked about the other night, this individual management is probably not going to be sustainable. Now, many of these issues involve individual wild animals seeming to occur in those residential and exurban areas, which brings up a classic thought experiment. If a tree falls in the woods, forest, and nobody's around, does it make a sound? Now, most of these reports of individual animal conflicts and issues, maybe abandoned animals, uh, occur primarily because you simply have more eyes in people's backyards than those wild areas. And we hear and see the deer in our backyard, especially when one ends up sick from, let's say, a disease like chronic wasting disease, or maybe attacked by a predator in our yard. However, I'd say that the average person has no concept for how, many, how common death and injury is to wild animal populations. And I think it's really interesting how much emphasis and resources our society puts into these issues we observe in our backyards, rather than what's going on in places we don't have as many human eyes. So I'll give you a little antidote here, maybe a little hint toward the quiz question. But two summers ago, in a four-day consecutive period, I counted four individual deer either being injured, euthanized, or found dead in the Gunnison city limit. And throughout the year, I would guess that the Gunnison CPW office probably averages a report of a sick, injured, or dead deer in a house every two weeks. Which brings me back to that quiz question. I'm going to open it up here. Got the answer on a graph. Or at least I'm going to show everyone's answers. Not your individual answers. Zoom in. Okay, so you can see that there. Uh, looks like, uh, I forget, how many respondents did we have, Alicia, Jake? 50 plus, 50 plus respondents here. And 20 some answered, 0 to 50. Gosh, I lost the winning ticket. Oh, here we go. Here it is. Got shoved in with some antenna cord. And a few answered 100 to 200, 200 to 300. A couple answered in the several thousand, 10,000, 20, 1,000 plus range, and that's fine. Um, and I probably wasn't very clear on exactly all the division and math, but, but the point is, is the real answer is this red line here approximately 580 on average and that's looking at the data from our population models 
we kind of know how many uh, does there are in late December and when they give birth. Um, but the winning ticket was 523. And the winning number is 831130. Any answer? Any winners? 523? All right. Now, I, I didn't try that hard at a cash prize. I came up with this about two hours ago. So I got $11 <laughs> from my own wallet. Give him a hand there. So it, let me bring back the presentation. Sorry about that pause. But this is essentially nature's cruel truth here. Answer is actually over that 36 year time period. It's, it ranges from about 340 fawns to 790 so far. And what this amounts to is uh, about 82 fawns per day. So, you know, the, you hear those clickers of how many car accidents occur every minute and so forth. I guess we could calculate that too. Um, well, but remember, this blue chart here actually shows it's not quite 82 per day. Um, a lot more are dying right after that birth happens, right? You got a lot of little Bambies running around, and then by December, it's dropped off dramatically. Now, this might sound a little alarming, this high number of animals that are dying every day in the Gunnison Basin, and that's just deer. Uh, but I think it's important for society to learn that all species in nature don't operate like humans or pets or livestock do. Wildlife populations have evolved these mechanisms to cope. For instance, one reason wild animal, why wild animals have synchronized breeding is that they can swamp the landscape with newborns. It's actually an anti-predator response. Um, in other cases, some have evolved to live longer, as uncertainty from year to year in, the, in environmental conditions can wipe out a whole clutch or a litter, so they gotta depend on uh, following years to reproduce. And the adaptation, I think, is most interesting because it does explain this abandoned baby animal syndrome, is that it is common for these wild mammal mothers to separate herself from her young in order not to draw attention to predators. So now, if we did have those infinite financial resources, I suppose society could help out every individual wild animal in need. Now, it's also important to understand that the mechanisms and adaptations that these wild populations have evolved with over thousands of years would eventually be lost. And I would guess that these adaptations are what makes these animals wild in the first place. And I would bet for many of you and much of society that the wildness characteristic is something that we value. So the next part of this talk is going to shift gears to the population characteristics of interest for managing these wild populations. And these are just somewhat boring terms, actually, that a wild just might use to describe a population of wild animals. And the first is gonna be sex ratio. Show some examples. For this population of rabbits, we have four bucks and 10 does, which is the same as 40 bucks per 100 does. Or if you wanna look at it as a percentage, you have 29% bucks. Next is age structure. And in this example, you got five kits and 10 does. And that would equate to 50 kits per 100 does, or 33% kits. And then we have abundance, which describes the population size and numbers of individuals. Sometimes we just refer to this to, as in. And in this example, we have 12 rabbits. You can count them on your fingers almost. None are hiding behind each other here. There's no tricks. And then we have this idea of distribution, which takes on this component of space. And once we know where the animals in that population are at, we can get a measure of density. <coughs> So in this example, I would say that this rabbit population has a distribution that is just kind of random across this landscape. And in this example here, they have a uniform distribution, and this would be a cluster distribution. Then if we were interested in density, we could just say, okay, there's still 12 rabbits in this landscape, 12 per four square miles, but I'll put up four square miles of equal area, and we could say that section A has got a zero density, this is a low density, this is a really high density, and this is maybe a moderate density. And as a wildlife biologist, the most important thing is probably figuring out where the abundance is heading. Is it going up or is it going down? And 
The reason for this is we're interested in population size change and being able to predict that future population size. So we could do this with a population size equation. And if we know the number of births for one year, 12, 2017, and we know the number of births, deaths, immigrants, and immigrants, we could calculate next year's population size. And so we get two animals being born, two ra three rabbits dying, three rabbits uh, immigrating in, and one rabbit immigrating out, uh, we get 13 rabbits. So if we know something about those death birth rates, it's really important. So what are some drivers for this population change? Well, there's these density independent factors, and they're uh, things where the rate of death does not depend on abundance. These are random chance events. So a forest fire, for instance, that's not a real bunny on fire, that's the, I believe the Chinese zodiac sign. Or uh, we get road kills, or maybe a catastrophic flood. And uh, by the way, I, I, I did find many of these images online, so uh, um, I have to give those people credit. And then predation, and I mentioned predation because it's a little special because sometimes it can be density dependent and density independent. And density dependent factors, a little different here. And basically in these, the rate of death depends on the abundance and density of the population. And some might say, well, that's a snowstorm, that was a catastrophic event, maybe it's density independent. But um, we have three, let's say we have three deer in this population, and I would venture to say that if there's only one deer in that population, it might have a better chance of surviving on those few shrubs that are there than if all three are trying to go after them. Then we have diseases. You get more animals in a smaller area, higher density or higher abundance, higher chance of disease spread. And then predation. And the reason I say predation is also density dependent is because predator populations can respond to that prey population. Um, so there are some interesting things going on there that take a lot more time to explain tonight. And these density dependent factors grow in this way we call logistic growth. So um, many of you heard of this term multiplying like rabbits. And in a growing population of animals without any death, this is what that would look like. Okay, they're just multiplying on top of each other. Uh, but of course, animals die. And at some point, that population size is going to stop increasing and eventually level off as the birth and death rates are now equal. And the reason death rates are going to catch up with the birth rates is this idea of carrying capacity. Now, carrying capacity is essentially just what the geographic area bounding that population can maximally support. But it's not a straight line. It bounces around like crazy most of the cases. Um, you could overshoot it, you could be under it. And the number of animals supported by this area is set by the four brothers that Pat talked about last week, which are water, food, cover, and space. And it's important to note that the available amount of these four brothers can change depending on the current conditions. Thus, predicting carrying capacity in the future is usually really difficult. Now, in the Gunnison Basin, we have a really interesting situation with mule deer where that carrying capacity can change dramatically due to an extreme winter. Now every winter, Mother Nature erects this fence made of snow that keeps deer contained to the food resources, which in this case is primarily shrubs, in those lower elevations. Thus, the amount of food available to deer is dictated by the amount of area inside this fence. Basically, uh, where Mother Nature builds that fence in any given winter translates to the amount of food available to deer. Now, there are some quality things with food that um, are part of that too. Um, but in the case of last year, Mother Nature built that fence very low. And just a year later, she built that fence pretty high where we're at now. And the carrying capacity is essentially elevated right now compared to this situation. So if the data is available, biologists might spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out where the steepest point is on this growth curve. And the steepest spot is where that population growth rate is the highest. In economics, this might be referred to as maximum stain yield. And in big game management, this is the sweet spot to have your population, as you have little chance of jumping above carrying capacity and causing damage to the resource. For big game animals like deer, this is where that reproductive <laughs> output is the highest. 
And thus you actually, this is the point where you have the highest number of animals available for a surplus harvest. If we are managing a herd at, at carrying capacity, remember, birth rates equal death rates. Thus, we don't have anything left over um, for uh, hunter offtake. Now, you may have noticed that this maximum sustained yield equates to a population size equal to the half of carrying capacity. And if you're in a ranch, into ranching livestock, and I know some of you are here tonight, you've probably heard the rule of thumb, take half, leave half. And for those in the crowd that don't ranch, it just means that one will actually have the, in theory, should have the best long-term return on their investment, and that's usually measured in weight gain of the cattle, if you put the number of cattle out on pasture in which the half of the grass resources are removed on an annual basis. The same thing goes for wildlife. Now, next part, counting them without using your fingers. Um, most often we're trying to compare population sizes between, between points in time, but we're also concerned with whether there are more or less animals here or over there. And sometimes the most obvious to everyone is a census method, which is the idea that you count all the animals in a population. However, this is usually a very expensive endeavor, and it assumes that all animals are visible. Animals aren't allowed to hide under trees, behind each other, or camouflage against their background too much. So I'm going to show a quick test here. Does everyone see the deer in the photo? Give you just yes. a little bit. And you probably saw that one. But did you get the back line of this one? How about the leg of this one? One more test. Actually, you could go online and type in deer hiding in background photos. and. There's tons of presentations on this, actually, for some odd reason. Uh, but I thought I hit a little gold mine here. But uh, there's, there's the deer right there. Okay, so sometimes we can easily address this expense issue, at least, this idea of counting them all, by just getting a sample of what's out there. And I ask, why do grocery stores give out samples of food? Because they're trying to give you an estimate, in terms of taste at least, of what's in the rest of the box. And we could do the same to sample wildlife populations, not for taste, but for number. Well, I suppose you could get them for taste. Uh, but to estimate the population of these rabbits here with sample quadrets, we can grid the area out into 16 sections, and then ran randomly sample four of these. And in this case, we could count three and a half in this cell, four and a half in this section, five in this one, two and a half in this one. And we average these all together, and you get four rabbits per section, extrapolate this all out to 16 sections, and you get an estimate of 46 rabbits. And, sorry, uh, I think of this is actually a pretty good estimate, considering I drew 65 rabbits out there in this population. But in practice, it's never this simple, and even with the quadrat approach, you still have animal visibility issues. So if we have some high vegetation, cover, I count them again, I get one and a half, uh, three, three and a half, one and a half, a uh, quick average of about 2.4. Extrapolate this out, we get 38 rabbits, which actually makes this a really poor estimate because there are 65 rabbits out there total. So to get around this visibility issue, we get to employ other techniques like distance sampling or mark recapture. And these are some of the more interesting methods, actually, but I unfortunately don't have time to explain them tonight. And finally, we have this population model estimation method, which was actually described earlier we know something about birth, death, and then migration rates, we can get an estimate for next year's population. And a primary benefit to this is we've got a pretty good idea of where this population is heading if we know the birth and death parameters. Last but not least are methods where we just want to measure change from one time to the next. And the crux of these surveys is that survey effort is equal or standardized among years or locations. And this might include surveys where the raw counts are done just in the field or maybe even by hunters or even, let, lo and behold, the U.S. Postal Service. And with Postal Service drivers, you often get these really standardized routes, same length, same amount of time that they drive it day after day, year after year. And sometimes, at least in other states, a wildlife biologist will hand them a data form and so that they record all the wildlife they observe along their routes. And that's useful once you look at a long-term data set. And, you know, in some cases, we don't even need to see the animal for these trend surveys to work. We might just look at animal sign. 
such as be the case with SCAT surveys. So to recap, population-based approach is what we're trying to use as wildlife managers or wildlife biologists anyway, rather than the individual level. There are various population characteristics. Uh, some may sound pretty boring, that people like me are going to measure. And we need to know what the population size is, at least where it's heading or has been. And with that, that concludes my talk. All right, well, thank you. Uh, tough to follow the other Kevin there for a minute, but uh, here's essentially what I'm gonna try to ad address here tonight is, you know, kind of the last bit of stuff we're doing here is to maybe put stuff in perspective for those of you that have been here for all three nights. And that is ultimately, how do we live uh, in a nice, healthy landscape that contains healthy populations of fish and wildlife. Um, and in doing that, I'm also gonna start looking at what is it like to be, uh, or what's a modern hunter or angler like? Uh, how do, you know, demographics that we've been hearing about, how do those affect uh, our management decisions? How does uh, these changing de demographics uh, affect funding for wildlife management? And then finally, how can we as uh, educated uh, functional citizens uh, participate in wildlife management in a very effective and functional way? So I wanna start with this first big question um, and that is why do you hunt or fish or why do you hunt and fish? Or if not, what do you think about people that hunt and fish? What motivates them? Well, that's a huge question um, because, let's see if I can make this, oh, sorry. Um, that's, a, that's a big issue for a, a lot of wildlife management agencies. Fish and Wildlife Service represented on the left, Colorado Parks and Wildlife represented on the right, also do a substantial amount of uh, surveys to get at what motivates people uh, to hunt and fish. Um, are they satisfied? Uh, what their activities are, those types of things. And so this is a report from about four years ago from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and this is nationwide, right? This is not Colorado specific, but uh, on these surveys, why did people hunt and fish? Well, there was the predominant reason, right? That you can see up here at the top is really for sport, recreation, relaxation or fun, food and meat, hanging out with other people, being close to nature. And then we get down to these things down here that have much less motivation for the average person. And one of those is uh, uh, trophy hunting. Right? When we compare males to females, uh, female hunters even more so respond that they go out to hunt for meat. Right? Uh, and once again, when we compare both of those, trophy hunting is relatively low uh, on that as well. <coughs> This study came out last year, and this is a, one of those human dimension studies. And the important thing, unfortunately, is right here on the crack. But uh, uh, this column is what you kind of really need to focus on. And the score is rated from zero to four. And the higher the number, the more of a motivation it is for somebody to go uh, uh, hunting. And the biggest predictors here are these nature-oriented factors. Uh, people want to learn about wildlife in their habitats. They want to be close to nature, spend time outdoors. And those are the big ones. And then coming down here, uh, obtaining meat is another big motivator. Um, and if you remember Brandon's talk, where we talked about the North American model of wildlife management, people actually uh, want to hunt because they, they believe that they're contributing to wildlife management efforts. It's an important value. Uh, some of the lower stuff tend to be achievement oriented things, right? Uh, using hunting equipment, that's like, I got a new toy, let's see if I can make this thing work, right? Uh, and then uh, obtaining a trophy is probably the lowest on there as well for motivation. Now, uh, this is kind of getting us out of our silo a little bit. 
because those are overall trends. But if we start breaking this down into individual groups, uh, this is a study that came out about two years ago that Colorado Parks and Wildlife put out. Uh, most important uh, motivators are at the top, least important are at the bottom. For residents, what you should need to notice is residents want to hunt every year, harvest for meat, and not see anybody else, right? <laughs> Which uh, I can relate to, right? <laughs> uh, Non-residents, they're paying, they're traveling, they're investing a lot more money, uh, tags are more expensive, they want to harvest a trophy, but they also want to hunt every year. Those two things don't go together, right? You can't, you can't accomplish both of those. And, oh yeah, right there, they want high success, right? Uh, next big question. Uh, what is a modern hunter or angler like? We all have perceptions of, of what hunters look like or anglers look like. Uh, and other sub-question is, are there more hunters and anglers or less, right? And once again, those uh, survey reports come out and on the horizontal axis down here is uh, years from 1991 to 2011. Uh, it's blatantly obvious what's happening here, right? Uh, hunters are, are aging. We're not getting as many uh, uh, younger people in, in the population recruited into uh, hunting and angling. Are there more, I, we always hear stuff, oh, there's a lot of people, there's all this crowding issue, there's, there's more hunters out there on the landscape. And uh, yes, that's true. So this is from 1960 uh, to today. Uh, all the stuff in green is an increase in absolute numbers of people holding a license. Uh, and that's increased throughout much of the United States. West Coast has declined, and the Northeast and uh, Upper Midwest has declined in absolute numbers of hunters. But here's, here's the caveat on some of this. As far as a proportion of the human population, the numbers of hunters and anglers has declined, right? And as a percentage, you know, we're, where's Colorado? We're way out here. Uh, we're setting at about a 12%, or not quite 12%, about a 10% decline as far as a percentage of the overall population that are hunters and anglers. And if you want to look at that on uh, maps, right, um, virtually everywhere on this map, there is a decline in the overall percentage of people hunting and angling out of the population. There's a few exceptions, the Southeast, Oklahoma, and North Dakota, but there's only like four people in North Dakota, so you know, an increase of a couple people is, is a huge percentage. So. Uh, and this shows uh, what's happening here and why that's the case. And it, it's been touched on by a variety of speakers throughout our series here. Uh, annual license holders from 1960 went up substantially, but then it's declined rapidly lately. Um, urban population is driving the human population here. Rural population has stayed relatively the same. What are people hunting? Right? That has also changed dramatically. Big game hunters, roughly about the same, about a 10% decline in, in big game hunting. The thing that's really had a, a major decline is small game hunting. We're roughly about half now compared to 1991 as far as people hunting small game. Uh, migratory birds has also been a substantial decline as well. It's primarily waterfowl that, that make that up. As far as demographics, some encouraging stuff here. The two biggest groups of uh, growth within the hunting in, uh, group is uh, females. And they're cu currently making up about 20% of hunters out there and bow hunting. And since, nine, since 2004, bow hunting has increased something like about 124%. Uh, so those are some big changes happening out there. Angling, as hunting has gone down, angling has actually increased, and we have about an 8% increase in angling participation since uh, 2011, and uh, expenditures on angling has also gone up. If we think all the way back to Corey's talk last week and what motivates people, right, um, and the way they relate to wildlife, uh, we talked about utilitarian, which is 
uh, wildlife is, is something to be used as opposed to mutualist where we're on an equal footing with wildlife. Um, we've had some dem demographic shifts there. And one of the surprising things that came out from the Parks and Wildlife Survey is that, yeah, utilitarian makes up most of the hunters, but there's a substantial amount of other people that actually hunt that also uh, have this uh, relationship or, or value wildlife as an equal in this case. Right. <laughs> and, and, and with the population change a little bit, uh, and we have this larger urban population, there are a group of urban people that do like to hunt, right? Uh, hipsters want to hunt, right? They may not look like uh, rural people that go hunting. They may want to uh, wear different clothes, uh, address things in a different way, have different motivations. Well, lots of game management agencies are starting to address those types of things. If you're a novice hunter uh, and you want to go to Delta on Saturday night, that you can have uh, a gourmet uh, wild game meal and have some cocktails and beer mixed with that. It's all sponsored by Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, and Needle Rock Brewing Company. So ways that uh, these game management agencies are starting to try to engage people in uh, different demographic groups as our dem uh, demographics are changing. Next thing on demographics. This is a fancy acronym for non-traditional path hunters. People that start hunting or fishing um, maybe later in life and have not uh, done it in very uh, traditional ways of entering into hunting and fishing. Traditional path hunters, this is very standard, typical type of thing that we, we had historically. And that is a parent, right, typically a male parent, or male family member taught somebody how to hunt, right? Uh, Non-traditional path hunters typically get social support really from close friends that take somebody else out, right? So that is something that has dramatically changed. What motivates a non-traditional path hunter has a lot of overlap with traditional hunters, like spending time outdoors, being close to nature, and spending time with family and friends is important, but one of their prime motivators is really to learn about wildlife and in engage in making sure they're understanding things and also obtaining meat turned into a, a, a much bigger motivator. Constraints on both of these groups, right? Um, we have our, our big game brochure here, right? Uh, regulations on hunting are more and more complicated all the time. Right? It, it, it's a challenging thing. I, I talk to people, they want me to sit down with them and, and explain how some of this type of stuff works. It, that's a hard thing, right? Firearm laws are getting much more challenging to deal with. Uh, and that's something I think uh, Parks and Wildlife and uh, these other regulatory agencies really started to have to deal with because things are getting incredibly complicated and it turns out uh, consistently those are some of the constraints to hunting and angling. We've touched on this, and this is actually Brandon's slide that he let me borrow, but I just want you to keep in mind that as I want you to look at this from this changing demographics, right? Uh, this was the Parks and Wildlife funding, right? It comes primarily from licenses. It's a user pay system. Uh, it also comes from lottery and GOCO money, and then excise tax from uh, these two uh, laws where uh, angling equipment, guns, and uh, ammuni ammunition have a tax on them that then come back into block grants to states to help fund wildlife. Another kind of uh, interesting one is the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Probably most people don't know about that one. It doesn't fund wildlife directly, but that is an excise tax off of oil offshore drilling. And that money comes back and it allows the acquisition of public lands. That might be a shooting range, that might be buying land from willing sellers or providing access to public lands, right? So it funds things like that. You've probably been around, if you've been paying attention to the news much, you start realizing that Parks and Wildlife, because of that declining 
percentage of population that hunts and fishes, um, and that changing demographics to where we have urban and suburban things coming together. We're starting to engage in more uh, wildlife conflicts types of things, and the people that are paying for that are the license holders primarily. Since we have not had a fee increase, and that's the predominant source of funding for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, their purchasing power has declined about 30% because we haven't had a fee increase uh, in a very long time. Moving through the legislature in the state of Colorado now is this Future Generations Act, and it would raise license fees to these amounts here, uh, or sorry, these amounts right here, and then give a uh, inflation rate after that so that once they caught back up and were at a sustainable level, uh, license fees would stay at uh, inflation rate. Another one moving through at the federal level, another big bill is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. This would be a excise tax on energy and mineral resources. The money for that would come back to the states in form of, once again, in the form of block grants and what this would do, right, hunters and anglers with their licenses pay for all the wildlife, game species and non-game species in the state of Colorado because we don't have general fund money uh, funding wildlife management. So, you know, endangered species, non-game stuff become an issue. This would provide funding for all fish and wildlife species, ideally to maintain those populations and keep them from getting endangered. Right? A little bit of a proactive approach uh, so that we could keep those populations healthy. So if that's something that uh, you think would be a value, you might want to talk to your uh, uh, state legislator or your uh, federal legislators. Other sources of revenue, uh, the, the big conflict that always comes up, hunters and anglers pay for everything, a lot of other people benefit. The question is, should they fund things as well? Some states have general fund tax money going towards that. Um, there's trade-offs there, right? Uh, right now, hunters and anglers feel like they have a bigger say in the way things are, should be managed. If the entire population is contributing, even though everybody owns wildlife, they might feel that there's more of a say, and that might in fact affect uh, hunters and anglers. Should there be special taxes on backpacks and uh, uh, camping gear, things like that, or permit systems on mountain bikes or things like that. Those are all things thrown around out there. I don't have the answers to this. I'm just giving you some examples of what's been talked about. How do demographics inf uh, influence uh, management decisions? So Kevin was talking about this a little bit. Uh, these are game management units that essentially correspond to major herds uh, in the uh, state of Colorado. As those more people come in, they need more resources. That can indicate, uh, result in a habitat quantity and quality decline. Uh, and then with that, if your population is going down, as you know, uh, hunting license applications are coming up for big game draws coming in the fall. Those preference point things, uh, high demand areas, require more preference points, you're getting in line, it's like a lottery system, you're increasing your chances uh, of going there. Um, and so the things that people have to think about that come into that human dimensions thing is opportunity. How often do you wanna hunt, right? Are you willing to put some of that off for a few years and hunt every few years? Uh, crowding, right? That was one of the things we talked about. Those have to go into these decisions as well as population management of big game animals and dealing with conflict. Uh, and what is that carrying capacity okay, that Kevin touched on? Uh, fishing, small game, waterfowl, those are typically managed just with, with tag limits, right? Uh, how, however many you can harvest at a given time. This is also getting back to what Kevin uh, Bletcher just talked about. What are you really looking for, right? Um, I work with some landowners own stream management a lot of times, and people always want a, a stream just packed full of giant fish, right? Uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> the problem is, right, you can have 
uh, that carrying capacity thing, which is a biomass, a, a amount of fish weight you could have in a stream. Now you can have a few really big fish, right? Which is awesome to have. And you don't catch those very often. Or you can have a stream full of a whole bunch of small fish and catch a whole lot of fish. But you can't have both ends of that, right? Or you can have somewhere in the middle. You can, you can balance that, right? So that all depends on, on our uh, habitat. So finishing this up, how should a citizen participate in the wildlife management process? Ian started our, our series here by saying, decision making around natural systems is hard. It's complex, there's a lot of individual stuff happening. Uh, we were supposed to take data, right? And incorporate your data. And a lot of you spend a lot of time out there on the landscape, right? Spend a lot of time on the landscape. What do you see? And people bring that up a lot. I don't see as many deer here. I see more elk there or, or, or what's happening, right? To, to a scientist such as myself, that's called natural history. You're out there, you're collecting some uh, beginning parts of the scientific process, and that's what gets the science started. It provides a question and a thought. You then have to incorporate that with a tremendous amount of data. And all that stuff that Kevin Bletcher just went over, that you simplified with little bunnies on the screen, in real life, <coughs> that's an obscene amount of data to get to those numbers. That is tremendous amounts of work, money, effort, labor, going out there counting and, and assessing those populations. It turns into one graph on a document like that, right? I've done those types of things before. I've done this type of research. It, it is incredible amount of work that goes into these little lines on that graph, right? He puts it into those models, and I'll tell you one thing I'll, I'll, uh, on this. All models are wrong, right? Every single model is wrong. That is okay, right? They're not gonna be 100% correct, because you'd have to count everything, know every bunny under every tree. You're never gonna get there. But they give you a perception of what's happening and you can start manipulating your model to, as an experiment to see what might happen in the future. And then you also have to take all that cool science and mess it up with a lot of human dimension research and what people want and perceptions and stuff like that. Okay? So finally here, once you have all that, uh, you, you spent your time in here, uh, you spend your time out there on the field, you educate yourself, you learn, uh, keep informed. CPW puts out a lot of information uh, that you can get on an email list. They'll send you stuff when things are happening. You can attend their events. We have regional representation and statewide representation on a sportsman's round table. Uh, I have a meeting on that one coming up on March 10th. We bring stuff to the upper management of CPW. There's online venues if you don't like to go out in public. Right? Uh, lots of committees, right? Uh, U.S. Forest Service and Gun Interesting right now is going through a forest plan revision. You can participate th in that. You can represent wildlife. You can represent your values there. I encourage you to do that. We live in a democracy, and then there's a whole lot of sportsmen's organizations. Some of them sponsored uh, this event tonight, right? Um, belong to those people. They keep you informed. Uh, they spend money out there to legislate for active uh, lobbying, uh, to represent your views, things like that. That's, that's incredibly important. So those are some opportunities. And I might uh, argue that those are some of our obligations in that North American model to participate in uh, the wildlife management process. And there we go. Cool.